Hello, my name is Liz Nesbitt, and I am the retired curator of invertebrate paleontology. I have been working here since 1993, um, and although I'm retired, I continue to come in all the time. Sushi Island is a really exciting place to go. First of all, you can only get there by boat or by float plane. So you have to start off from Orcas and it's about three miles by boat. So that's an exciting start anyway. When you get there, you find that it's an island with a lot of little islands in the middle. It's, it's a very strange shaped island. And you walk along to the south side and along the south side are where the fossils are, these fossils are. Um, on the north side, there are different fossils. There are not very many. And so it's hard work. And when you see them, they're very delicate. It's very hard to get out of the rock. You have to be incredibly patient. So this is Sushi Island. It is the northernmost island in the Washington side um, of the Gulf Islands. And then right next to it are Canadian Gulf Islands that have very similar rocks. The rocks on the very south end down here are these ones that are Cretaceous rocks that had the dinosaur and they have ammonites and other shells. We only have them on Sushi Island, so they're very precious for Washingtonians. Um, the top of the island is a different age completely. The rest of the island is 50 million years old, so we have a 25 million year gap, and it's really weird that we should get these two together. So I brought another little prop to show you. So if you have, um, I'll do it this way, the red part is the Cretaceous, the green part is the 50 million year old Eocene rocks. And what makes it so interesting is it is terrestrial, it has leaves, it is not marine. So what we think is that the one was lying on top of the other, just normal geology, and then they got squished up, and then they got squished again, and the bottom part of the green got eroded away. And so we're very lucky to have this little tiny sliver of Cretaceous showing up behind um, the, the other stuff. When we go to Sushi, you have to collect with a permit. It is a state park. It is illegal to collect fossils there, and you need a permit. We have the only permit, we being the Burt Museum, have the only permit, and we have a couple of people who go there regularly to collect. One of them is David Starr, and he has done a great deal of this work. He is a, an amateur collector, a very high caliber amateur collector, who has collected these ammonites, prepares them, and donates them to the museum. So the rock is a regular gray, nothing looking rock. It's marine sediments. It was fairly deep water, so there's not even any texture to the rocks very much. And what you're looking for is bright, shiny pieces. So here is an ammonite with the bright, shiny shells, and that's what you have your eye out for. You have your eye out for something that's looking like it's gonna stick right out of the rock. A lot of the fossils aren't like that. A lot of the fossils are just brown. Um, and you're not going to see that shiny thing. But once you start walking around and looking, your eye gets into it. And of course, your enthusiasm is huge, so you're quite sure you're going to find the most perfect fossil as you walk along. So here are some of the ammonites we've found in Sushi Island. There are many more in the cabinet. We have um, probably two cabinet rows of them. The one thing I want to start off with, though, is most of these big fossils are found in what we call a concretion. And a concretion is rock that has become really hard and cemented with calcium carbonate around a fossil. What we think happens is when an animal dies, bacteria comes and start to disintegrate the animal. That changes the chemistry of the rock and it becomes full of calcite and becomes a concretion. It's cement. So I had one here to show you. So here we have some spectacular clams from Susha. These are Inoceramus clams and they're always also have this beautiful shiny shell. And that's the other half. And if you stick it together, you have a concretion, a very big concretion. And what you have to do when you see this in the field is, first of all, you look at it and think, well, there's probably going to be a fossil in there because you can see a tiny little bit of a fossil sticking out right there. You have to use your hammer and your chisel. You have to turn on the side and use your feet and mind your fingers and really smash it incredibly hard. And it should break open exactly where the shells are. And there you get the inside of your concretion. So I'd say most of the fossils we're looking at from Susha come from concretions. 
Here's a little tiny one that's been taken out of the concretion. You can see the rock and you can see the shell inside. I know not from working in Susha, but from working in other places in Western Washington where there are a lot of concretions, you can hit a hundred concretions before you get a fossil. It is a long, tough day opening up concretions. But the excitement when you find a fossil, it's totally worth it. This is probably the most common ammonite that you'd find on Susha. We have quite a few of them, but remember they've been collected for over a hundred years. It's called Canadoceros and it is around up and down the coast at this age. Um, you can see that it's, it's kind of like a cinnamon roll, looking at it, and it's the same on both sides. The animal would be here, sticking out here, and I have a toy to show you that, because these are invaluable. So here's my little toy of Canadoceros with an ammonite inside. Ammonites are squids, related to squids. They have tentacles. We really don't know how many tentacles they have, whether they have lots or little or what, but this is a good toy to show you what it looked like. So that's Canadoceros. We have a number of Canadoceros. The one thing about them is it has these ridges. I pulled out this one too, just to show you that it can get considerably bigger. We have a lot more Susha Island fossils in here. We actually have a lot of Cretaceous fossils. Much of it comes from Canada, but here's our Susha Island collection. So I've talked about ammonites, let me get back to them, but the other thing we do find in Susha are clams, which you saw that great big clam, and snails. And so we have a couple of really nice snails. This is a Volutoderma. It is a Cretaceous snail that you find up and down the coast. Um, and that's a particularly pretty one. They often break, so really nice to have a complete one. Very rare, we have a sand, uh, sea urchin. Why are, are those so rare? I think they're so rare because they don't preserve very well. I'm sure there were lots of them there, just as there are if you go to the beach now and you go tide pooling, you'll see them. They're delicate. And if they don't get filled in with sediment before a wave comes along, so they'll be totally crushed. Um, they're also good food for, for snails, so they probably will get totally crushed by the, by the snails. We have another drawer here of different um, ammonites and a further drawer of different ammonites. There are about 20 species of ammonites, clams and snails in Sushi, not a very big um, species number, but it's a really small area in which we're collecting. Here's another little concretion. with a baby ammonite, some clams and some snails. So that would have looked like that. And you can see the ammonite sticking out there. And so you would have busted open and found that inside. Besides um, those ammonites that look like little coils, there is some really strange ammonites that you find in the Cretaceous. And a few of them are in Susha. And those are ammonites called heteromorphs heteromorphs meaning different shapes. These ammonites that don't coil up and look like regular ammonites, they, some of them are just straight and long, some of them are coiled in different directions and look really weird. They were very successful, all these different types. We don't actually know why they did this or how they did this, because um, the vast majority of ammonites are the regular coil. The one that is really important in Susha is this, which is Bacchylites in Ornatus, and this is a very small part of the shell. So Baculite is, is a walking stick shell, so it was a long, skinny um, shell that the animal only lived in a small part. The rest, we assume, was filled with air and floated. We think they floated this way round in the water with the tentacles hanging out here and grabbed whatever they did. All ammonites are carnivores. All ammonites have beaks, they have tentacles, they're going to grab anything to eat that they want to eat. The amazing thing about these heteromorphs is they still had those chambers inside. So they were doing weird things to their shells even though they had the constriction of the chambers inside. So here's another heteromorph um, and these are two different kinds and you can see how they can 
curl over. So they're like a walking stick that's been bent in half. There are other more complex ones, but we don't have them from Susha. Here's the same one again, but a little bigger. And this one you see does not have that shiny nacreous layer to the shell. Very interesting ammonites. All ammonites became extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. They became extinct when the dinosaurs became extinct because of a major change in the ocean. It was probably their food source that made them go extinct. It could have been the way that the juveniles ate or lived. All we know is every, all ammonites became extinct. So those are some of the animals that have come from Susha that you can see that are in the Burke Museum collection. And it just reminded me how much fun it was to go out there. As a professor, I would take students out on field trips and we would look for fossils um, under the permit because I was one, one of the people on the permit. And we'd also go to the other side of the island and look for leaf fossils because it was just really exciting for the students to start in the Cretaceous and end up 50 million years in the Eocene. So thank you everybody for watching. If you have questions, you can put them on the chat line and Brandon and I and Katie will be here at the end to answer any questions that you might have. I hope to talk to you later.